Yes, it is. Oh, that is who you are. We well, welcome you to Central Christian Church this morning, and I'm glad that you have chosen to come worship with us here in the building. And if you're worshiping with us online, and we're just as glad that you're doing that as well. We have some visitors with you with us today. We're always glad to have some guests. Uh, welcome to Central Christian Church. And if you have any questions about what we do or who we might be, feel free to stop me after we're done this morning, and I'll be glad to try to answer some questions for you. A couple of announcements before we start our time of worship. Our handbell choir is going to begin again this coming Sunday the 24th. So if you're interested in doing that, please let Rachel Day know that you would like to be doing that. I believe they'll probably be playing and practicing for Easter, although I'm not sure that's true. But uh, we had a great time letting them play for us over the Christmas holidays. And that's certainly available to you if you'd like to learn how to do that. Copies of the Daily Bread devotional are on the table in the foyer. Uh, feel free to take one of those if you would like to. They're three months at a time devotional, and they're yours for the taking. Uh, last would be, we are still collecting shoes uh, for Etcha. Etcha collects whatever kind of shoes you've got. So if you've got new shoes for Christmas and you're wondering, what am I going to do with my old ones, uh, bring them here. Put a rubber band or tie the shoes together if you would. There's a spot you can put them back here on this pew in the back hallway, and we'll get them to the place. The only thing they ask is that you not bring uh, high heels anything else and seriously it doesn't matter what kind of condition they're in if you've got old tennis shoes that have holes in them uh, they'll gladly take those they ship them overseas and give them away so they'll take whatever you have and so take note of that if you would uh, let's go to god in prayer and we'll begin our time of worship god we are so thankful that you love us the way you do thankful that we can gather here as part of your family and we pray, Father, as we come to you and praise and encourage one another, uh, that we will glorify you and our prayer is that as we leave this building later today, that we will leave ready to let your light shine through us. Father, thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. We stand on a solid rock. This morning, God is able in every situation and every day.
with our worship. We pray these things in your name. Amen. It would be time for children's worship. It's nice to know, is it not, that there is an anchor that shall not be moved. I don't know about you, but I suspect most of us are fighting storms in our lives at the moment. Things that are going on in our lives that we wish would calm down some. We long for that calmness. We long for that peace. We long just sometimes to be able to get up in the morning and not think about all the stuff we have to do today. But church, whatever is going on in your life today, we have an anchor that you can hold on to, Jesus Christ. Don't ever let go of him. We're continuing our series on faith, looking at how you and I can develop a faith 
that will remain anchored to Jesus Christ. If we're hanging on to something else, we're hanging on to the wrong thing. And every one of us, myself included, through the years, have from time to time held on to the wrong thing. And we've depended on things that we thought were going to last forever, things that we thought would be secure, things that we thought would be able to take care of us, and we have been disappointed time after time after time, if you're much like me. And you've come to realize, really, the only thing that is secure, the only thing that you know is going to be there day after day, month after month, year after year, is Jesus Christ and our God. We have a thief who wants to come. Jesus says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. His primary purpose is to cause the children of God to lose that joy, that peace, that comfort, that assurance that we can have when that anchor is secure and we're holding on to it. Satan cannot rob us of our salvation. But he can make your life so miserable if you allow him to that the joy of your salvation is gone. And your ability to be a child of God and draw others to Jesus Christ is made ineffective because he steals from us the ability to do the things God wants us to do simply by getting inside our mind and causing us to doubt, causing us to fear, causing us to give up. And we looked last week at how we need to stand against him and how we need to resist him. The Bible says if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. What well, thing we need to remember, though, is he doesn't stay gone. He finds another way to come back. So that resistance that we have to have has to be continually renewed and enforced so that we can resist him. As we think about faith and we think about life and we wonder what is it that's important to God, I wondered as I was putting this lesson together, what is it that's important to us? And sometimes if we're not careful when somebody says, well, how are we doing at church? You know me long enough to know I don't even like to call this at church. We are the church, right? We are the church whether we're in this building, whether we're at home, whether we're driving down the road, whether we're at work, whatever we're doing, we are the church. We as the church gather in this building collectively. But you understand what I mean when I say we come to church. Sometimes we look at life and we think, well, if I just try harder, you know, if I just maybe work longer hours, if I just read my Bible more, maybe if I had a better prayer life, maybe if I would just do all of this stuff I need to be doing, my life would be better. And we look at ourselves if we're not careful, and we sometimes think it's all about me. If I would just work more, and sometimes we do this in our churches, don't we? We think we're being successful if the number of people that show up here on Sunday grows through the years. Or we think the congregation we're in is doing well if our budget exceeds, or the money we bring exceeds our budget. We somehow look at life and we measure it sometimes the same way we measure our secular life. We talked about that last week some. If you've got money left over at the end of the month, you've won. If your money goes away before the 30th comes, you've lost. And if we're not careful, we bring that same mentality into our relationship with God. And we view our efforts as though somehow we're earning his love, we're earning his salvation, we're earning his grace. And if we just try harder, work harder, put more effort into it, somehow we'll be better Christian folk. And we've allowed this Protestant work ethic that says if I just try harder, I can lift myself up by my own bootstraps. Church, there's no room for that in Christianity. There's no room for that in our relationship with God. You and I don't ever lift ourselves up by anything. Jesus Christ lifts us up. He brings us into his presence. He gives us the ability to do the things God wants us to do. If you read the letters of Paul, you find out real quick what he thought was important. We're going to look briefly at 1 Thessalonians this morning. Paul wrote two letters to them. And if you read through those letters from time to time, you will find that Paul sent Timothy to find out what was going on with them. Timothy apparently traveled back and forth between Paul and Thessalonica from time to time. 
And Paul sends Timothy to find out how's the church doing there. And if you read the letter of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, you'll find that Paul asks questions like, do they have their own building yet? You know, is their budget exceeding what they've planned for? Are there many people showing up on Sunday morning? Do you people really believe that's what he was asking? You know, if you've read those books, you know Paul never asked about that at all. His primary concern is not how many people are in the pews. His primary concern is not how many missionaries have you sent out. His primary concern is not what's going on in your small life groups. Paul had one thing that really affected him when he was concerned about the church at Thessalonica. And that is, how's their faith? Look at what he says as he writes this letter in chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians. In verse 2 he says, We sent Timothy to strengthen and encourage your faith. In verse 5 he says, I sent to find out about your faith. In verse 6 he says, Timothy has now come back to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and your love. Verse 7 says, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. Verse 10 says, we pray that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Can you get the idea of what was on Paul's mind? Paul wasn't worried about all the things that we so often worry about. Paul wasn't concerned about the things that we so frequently make primary in our business meetings, our elder meetings, our congregational meetings, all the things that worry us the most and that we think are most important, Paul never mentions in his letters. He's concerned about faith. He's concerned about your relationship with God. He's concerned with how are you dealing with that relationship with God Almighty? Are you resting assured in Him? Are you holding on to that anchor? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Is that what your hope's built on today? You know, if we really sat down and took inventory, I suspect some of us, myself included, as we started writing down that list of what are you relying on, some of that would be, I hope my heater doesn't go out this winter. Some of you have had that happen. I hope this old car that I'm driving gets me through another six months. I can't afford one right now. I really would like that new job. There's a promotion coming up at work, and it's between me and those other three people. I'm sure praying to God that I get it. And church, let me assure you, there's nothing wrong with going to God with those needs. There's nothing wrong with asking God for whatever's going on in your life. James writes in his book, some things you don't get because you don't ask. Church, never miss out on a blessing from God because you don't ask him for it. Now, God knows the answers. He knows, and we've looked at this long enough to know, that God will do for you what's good for you. And what is good for you is your relationship with him getting stronger and stronger. You see, if we're not careful, we think what's good for me is that raise. We think what's good for me is that new house that I've been longing for. We think what's good for me is my kids are doing what they're supposed to do and I don't have to worry about them. We think what's good for me, and we can fill that blank in with all kinds of things that we think would make us good. But in reality, the one thing that God wants to do to make us good is to draw us closer to him. We sang that song about the storms, about the clouds. And that last line was something like, how cool it's going to be when we pass over to that other side because of the storms we've been through. It's going to be so much greater to realize those storms are all in the past when we stand before our God in eternity. But while we're here on this earth, it is just as blessed if we will rest assured in him even in the midst of these storms God doesn't always take the storms away but storms can be used to deepen the faith we're supposed to have in Jesus Christ 
And notice Paul, even though he's writing about, I need to find out about your faith. I want to find out what's going on. I want to see if you're growing in your faith. He says there in that verse 10, I hope to come back so that I can supply what is lacking in your faith. In other words, no matter what your faith is like now, no matter how well you may be doing in your relationship with God, there's always room for improvement. There's always a way to grow closer to God. I don't care how close you may feel to him this morning. You can feel closer. Not because God comes closer to you, but because we go closer to him. Our mind focuses on him more. Our assurance and faith and hanging on to that anchor becomes stronger and stronger as we live our lives. And if we will do that, we'll have the glories that God has promised to us. You see, Paul knew that faith was important. Paul knew that because he knew what 11, Hebrews 11, 6 says, that is, without faith, it is impossible to please God. We can have the biggest building in town. We can have the largest congregation in town. We can have a budget that exceeds our wildest dreams, and we can do anything we wanted to do with that money. But church, if we don't have faith, if we're not relying on God to make all these things come together and work the way he wants them to work, none of that really matters. We need to focus the way we're supposed to be focusing. If you read through the Gospels, you find several encounters that Jesus has and with different people, and you find that not much amazed Jesus. I mean, he's the guy who created it all, right? John chapter 1 says nothing was made, but it was made through him. He created all of this. He's part of that Godhead that knows everything. And so as we read through the Gospels and read about him, you rarely find Jesus being amazed by the things that he sees. You don't find him saying something like, boy, I did it right this time. When I asked Matthew to be one of my disciples, I really picked a winner. That guy is a financial genius. I'm just amazed at what he knows. Jesus didn't do that. He never gets shocked by the righteousness of people. He never gets amazed by the things people can and cannot do as far as their physical lives are concerned. But there is one thing that the Bible says Jesus was amazed at. When the Roman centurion came to Jesus, he had a servant who was sick. And Jesus says, well, let me just go with you to your house and I'll take care of that. And the centurion says, don't bother. You don't need to come to my house. You just say the word, and it'll be so. And Jesus says, we find this in Luke chapter 9, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Now, the crowd following him were a bunch of Jews. And I imagine for a moment they probably got a little offended, thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, Jesus. Here's this Roman centurion, this Gentile, doesn't even worship the God we worship probably, and you're amazed at his faith and you've not found any such faith in all of Israel. What do you think we are? You see, Jesus knows our hearts. Jesus knows our minds. Jesus knows whether we really put our trust in him or we're simply saying we do, hoping to get stuff from him. In Matthew chapter 15, Jesus comes across another foreigner, a Canaanite woman who comes to Jesus pleading on behalf of her daughter. Jesus, in a way, tries to push her away, saying, you're not Jewish, I'm not here for you yet. One of those strange passages in the Bible that we look at and wonder, what is going on here? Jesus loves everybody, right? And the answer is yes, he does. And notice the consequence of this. This woman would not take no for an answer. 
She wouldn't let Jesus rebuff her and tell her, I'm not here for you yet. I'm here for the house of Israel. He, she keeps pleading and pleading and pleading. Even the dogs, she says, get the crumbs that fall off the table. Jesus says in verse 28, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. There's another story in Mark chapter 6. Jesus has been out traveling. He's doing things. His reputation is growing, and he goes back to Nazareth, his hometown, and he's there to, to teach and to preach to them. And the Bible says in Mark 6, verses 5 and 6, that he could not do many miracles there, except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. That's another one of those strange passages and certainly it can't mean that Jesus couldn't have healed whoever he wanted to. Jesus could have done whatever he wanted to do. But Jesus is moved by faith. Jesus is moved by your faith. He's moved by my faith. And here in this little town of Nazareth, he was not moved by the faith of those people that knew him but didn't believe. And so because of their lack of faith, Jesus didn't do much there. Faith impresses Jesus Christ. Faith is what moves mountains. He says, if you have faith as the grain of a mustard seed, and church, I'm sorry to say, some people who profess to be Christians don't even have that. We've been raised in a church. We've been raised in a family. We've been taught things about what makes a good Christian, and we all know what those things are, right? We don't drink. We don't cuss. We don't go to bad movies. When I grew up, we don't play cards. We could play dominoes, but you couldn't play cards. There's all these rules of things you couldn't, couldn't do. And please don't say because I listed those that I'm telling you you can't do those things. I'm not your boss. But if we're not careful, being a good Christian becomes a list of things I can do and things I can't do. And it's no wonder so many people look at Christianity and say, what a boring, horrible life you've chosen. You never get to have any fun. Church, being a Christian isn't about having fun. It's about having joy. And that joy comes when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And you do the things you know that pleases Him. And you try not to do the things that you know don't please Him. But God isn't impressed by whether we do or don't do the things we're supposed to do or aren't supposed to do. What amazes God, according to the Gospels, is whether or not our faith is growing, whether or not the faith we have is secured on his anchor. And if we will make our faith stronger by putting our trust in him and allowing him to develop that in us, we can have that relationship with God that he longs to have with us. And when your faith is right, these other things will take care of themselves. When you put your faith and your hope on Jesus, you're reading the book. You're trying to figure out what is it that pleases God? What displeases God? What should I do or not do so that God and I have a great relationship? And you and I know when we're not living right, it's primarily because our faith has weakened. It's because we've lost that connection. It's because we've stopped dwelling upon the one thing that is so important in our relationship with God, and that's our trust in Him. And we've started trusting in ourselves. And we started doing things the way we want to do them. Peter wrote in 1 Peter verse 1 that it is through faith we are shielded by God's power. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6 that it's the shield of faith that we have that can stop all those darts Satan is throwing at us. When your faith is strong enough and when Satan attacks, you rely upon God and the faith you have in him to resist those things. Not your own power, not your own might, not your own ability, but on God to give you the strength 
and the power to make things work. We live in a time when so many people are teaching that to be a good Christian, all you have to do is just say a few magic words and send us your $37.50 and everything will be just fine. We're being taught by television evangelists that being a good Christian simply means doing whatever it is they tell you to do. Church, being a good Christian means your faith is anchored in Jesus Christ and it's deepening and deepening as time goes by. If your faith is the same today as it was a year ago, you're not doing very well. Have you measured your faith lately? Have you ever sat down and really taken an inventory of your faith and tried to figure out how much do I really trust God? How much am I really relying upon Him to be the one that's going to take care of me? I challenge us all to do that maybe this week. Sit down at home somewhere and just stop and get a piece of paper, get a pencil or a pen, or set at your computer screen and start putting down, what do I trust in? What am I relying on? What are the things that are most important in my life today? And see where faith really fits in. Now, most of us can cheat, and we can put faith at the very top, right? We can think, well, we can do that with Bob. We'll, we'll put faith first. And then we'll list all these other things, and we'll be right. So if you're tempted to do that, let me challenge you to do something else. Find some, some people, two or three people that know you the best, and ask them, what do you think is most important to me by the way I live? If those people will say, your faith in God, then you're doing okay. But if the people who know you best, and you ask them that question without letting them know ahead of time what you want the answer to be, and say to them, what do you think matters most to me by the way I live and the things I talk about and the things I strive for and see what they tell you? That's the challenge, church, is being able to face life, keeping our faith and trust in God, and making it such that the world who knows us knows that being right with God is our number one priority. You know, we all go through battles and trials. There's a neat passage in Romans chapter 4 that talks about Abraham. Remember Abraham? The father of the faithful. God's promised him seeds, heirs, descendants, more than the sky, stars in the sky, more than the sands by the sea. And here's Abraham and Sarah, old women, old man, no kids. And yet God's promised them all these descendants. Paul writes this about Abraham, Romans chapter 4, beginning in verse 19. It says, without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Here's Abraham. He knows he and his wife are way past child-rearing or child-bearing ages. And I got to tell you, church, I would not want to be 100 years old and have a new baby. Just, just as an aside, that's just me. But here's Abraham, and he knows I'm not going to have any more kids. I can't. Sarah can't have any more kids. She can't. We've passed that age. And yet it says, even though he knew that, the next verse says, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God has power to do whatever he had promised. Church, that's the kind of faith I want, isn't it? What you want? Faith that looks at circumstances, looks at what's going on around us, and realizes there's no way this is going to work. I can't make this work. There's no way this is going to happen. It's beyond my wildest dreams, never going to happen. But I've got faith that if God wants it to happen, it'll happen anyway. See, church, that's the kind of faith you and I need to be striving for. The kind of faith that looks at this country we live in and we think there's no way in the world this country is ever going to get back together. 
God could make this country come back together if the people who are faithful would start living the way we're supposed to. If we would react the way we're supposed to. And I'm ashamed to say that through these past few years, there have been times when I probably, not probably, there have been times when I haven't responded to circumstances the way I should have. And I've got upset at things going on in our nation. And I apologize for that. I want to be a man who reflects a faith in God no matter what's going on in this world. No matter who's in the White House, no matter who's in Congress, no matter who's in Nashville, no matter who's where, I want people to know that my faith in God does not waver simply because of what's happening in American politics. Too many of us put our faith in other stuff. And so when the world falls down around us, we want to give up. We want to moan and groan. We want to curse God and die, as Job's wife told him to do. But church, if our faith is right, we don't do that. Sometimes, though, we talk to people, good Christian people, and they say, it seems like my Christian life is just a struggle. I just struggle all the time. I just need to try harder. I just need to make more of an effort. I just need to really get some of that gusto. And when we do things like that, we're saying to God, it isn't your power, God, it's all mine. You see, if we're struggling all the time because we're simply trying harder, we've missed the point of where our faith and strength comes from. It comes from the Lord. It isn't a matter of trying harder. It's a matter of believing more. It's a matter of trusting God more. That's the challenge for us in this study of faith, is to have our faith deepen and grow. So that no matter what's going on around us, we're not ready to give up. We're not ready to throw in a towel. Instead, we're ready to turn our face to God and say, God, it's all about you. Either you fix it or it's not fixable. I read a comment the other day that said this. The greatest Christian is not the one who has achieved the most, but rather the one who has received the most. When you receive the blessings from God, that fruit of the Spirit that's love, joy, peace, patience, all those things the Bible says are ours if we just put our faith in God. And we just willingly receive that instead of trying harder to earn it, to get it. Instead, we just open ourselves and say, God, here I am. It's all up to you. You help me be the person you want me to be. And when we do that to God, God rewards us. He gives us that strength. He gives us that ability. And we can be the people God calls us to be through his power. We need to believe that we can be all things through Christ who strengthens us. We looked at a verse last week that says we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Not because we're so strong, not because we're so mighty, not because we're so able, but because Jesus Christ has already won the battle. He's already proposed to give us everything we need that pertains to life and godliness. Our challenge is to say yes to him, to yield ourselves to him, and let that faith develop the way it should. Let's pray. Father God, we are so thankful that you love us the way you do, that you provide for us the ability to live the kind of lives you want us to live. Father, our prayer this morning is that we will turn to you in faith, that we will rely upon you to be the God, the worker, the power that's possible to make us the people you want us to be. God, help us to realize that as we look at the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6, that all of that armor is yours, that you supply it to us, you provide it to us. So God, help us, I pray, to let our faith in you strengthen and grow. Help us to be assured that you're the anchor, 
that our hope is built on nothing less but on you. And as we face life with all of its challenges and trials, that God, we turn those trials over to you. We let you work through our life to resolve them for us. And we thank you no matter the consequences because our faith will deepen and grow if we'll just turn to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're here this morning and maybe you're struggling with something in your life you'd like us as a congregation to pray about, we'll do that with you. We know that every one of us struggle. We know that just because you become a Christian doesn't mean everything goes the way you would like it to in this material, secular world. And we have a God who says, you pray to me. You come to me asking. And I'll do what's best for you. So maybe there's something we can pray for for you. Maybe you've got to pray something good that's happening in your life, like Rhonda talked about last week. A prayer that's been answered that just, as much as I hate to say it, amazes us. You know, isn't it something, and, and I do this a lot, I get amazed at the way God answers prayers. And sometimes when I say I do that, it makes me realize, what was I expecting? <laughs> you know, <laughs> why am I so shocked that God answered a prayer the way I wanted him to? But see, we do that sometimes. Wow, isn't that amazing? No, that's just God. So maybe God's done something in your life you'd like to share with us. Maybe there's something else you'd like to share. There's no magic to coming down front. You can be praying to God while we're singing this invitation hymn any way you want. But we're going to sing this song. And if you'd like to have us share something with the congregation this morning, come down and share that with us while we stand and sing. This was sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the same. be seated for a moment. Raylan came up and said, I want you to pray for my brother, if you would. He leaves tomorrow to go to boot camp. He's going to the National Guard. She said, would you please just pray for him and pray that he, that goes well? And she said, also, please pray for my dad. He goes back out on the road tomorrow. So if we would remember that and pray for them. And Mary Lou says she has an unspoken request for her son, Cody, and we'll certainly pray for that as well. And Donnie's brought me up his phone because there's something cool in it. And uh, it's a praise. I mean, he's talking to his son, and he says, In the middle of the journey of our life, I found myself astray in a dark wood where the straight road had been lost, kind of the way America is growing. Here's the answer. Thankfully, hope isn't found in America, but in God alone. You know, church, we need to remember that. We love this country. It's a great land, but our hope can't be based on America. And then he quotes from Daniel chapter 2. It says, He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. 
He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. Boy, isn't that something to hang on to in America? We don't trust America. This isn't where our hope is. Our hope's in God alone. And we go to him in prayer and we ask for his help. But church, ultimately, our relationship with God doesn't hinge upon how America's doing. It depends on how we're doing. What's my relationship with God? But Paul writes, we need to pray for our rulers, for those leaders, those people who are in power. And church, I hope we're doing that. I hope we're praying for America, for the men and women who have been elected to office, because that's something we need to be doing. So let's do that. Let's Alex, do you have anything from the online? Yeah, I was going to say, uh, Reed and Jimmy said I'm having muscle spasms in my neck because I was shot last night and I'm on muscle uh, 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 Keep praying for Donald's America. Also, keep uh, praying for Rachel Black. Okay. Uh, Julie Gidley says she's having some spasms in her neck. She had to go to the doctor and get some shots yesterday. Uh, so please pray for that. Uh, also be praying for her daughter, Alicia. Uh, we can certainly keep praying for Samantha as well. And what was the other? Uh, Rachel's and Rachel's dad, Sam. As you know, he's uh, been diagnosed with cancer. They decided not to do the surgery. And so they're going to, I presume, try chemo or something to try to make that uh, be suppressed. So be in prayer for Sam as well. Let's pray. God, we are so thankful. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. God, I confess, sometimes we don't do that very well. Sometimes we trust in ourselves, we trust in our own power, we trust in a myriad of other things other than you. So God, help us, I pray, to trust you more. We pray for Cody, for what's going on in his life and the needs that he has. We pray for Raylan's brother and for her dad and the needs that they have. Father, we rejoice with Donnie and his son and realizing as he shared that with us this morning that you are the one we need to trust in. You are the one that gives power to nations, to kings, to those in authority. God, help us to remember that. Help us to remember that it isn't the land we live in, it isn't the political party that's in control, but it's you. And help us in America to realize that. Thank you for the blessings you've given us here in this land. God, we do pray for Julie. We pray for the pain that she's going through, that you would relieve that for her. We pray that you'd be with Alicia and the issues that she's dealing with in Florida. And that you'd be with Sam and Samantha, the things that she's going through here. And Father, we pray for Rachel's dad, Sam Wagner, that you would be with him as he goes through this cancer journey. And pray that you'd be with him and with his family, with Daniel and Rachel, as they go through this journey with him. We pray, Father, for a healing. We pray for the chemo to work what it's supposed to do. We thank you that we live in a time when doctors have come up with chemotherapy that can suppress cancer and in some cases even heal it. Thank you for that wisdom and that power you've given humanity. We just ask, Father, that we would live our lives in such a way that would give you glory. Help us to be the people you call us to be. We praise you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Rob? have heard of Beyond Meat or Ultimate Burger or something like that? Has everybody heard of that? Is, have any of you tried it? Oh, have you? Very good? <laughs> well, they're all made with something that isn't meat, uh, but with something else, something that goes beyond meat. And we trust that the experience will be at least as satisfying as the real product, at least that's what the ads say. Well, let's think about that for a moment, going beyond, beyond the horizon, beyond the next McDonald's, 
beyond what we thought possible. On this past Wednesday, we had to put down our 15-year-old poodle, Isabella. She lived a good life. She was a wonderful puppy. She brought joy to our girls for most of their lives. Abby was 11, Hannah was 8, and Ellen was 4 when we got her as a Christmas present for her. Uh, she was three months old and about as big as a softball. She was about that big, and she only grew to about that big. She was a teacup. That, yeah, teacup poodle. And, and it's amazing how attached we become to our pets in such a short time, and then over a longer time, uh, that bond becomes greater. So it was a sad time for sure. And uh, but as the vet administered the final shot, I started thinking, what now for Isabella? Is this all there is for animals? Just this life? I don't know if there's a doggy heaven or not. We like to think so. It helps comfort us. But that led me to a deeper, more sobering thought. What about those who think that this is all there is to life? Just this life here on earth. What about those that don't know Jesus? Or those who've rejected him? What do they think lies beyond this life? Because I thought if there's nothing beyond, that once the lights are out, that's it. And what was all this for? What is all this for? What's the purpose of life for us as humans if that's all there is? Why do most of us try to live at least an ordered, peaceful life? What does any of it matter if that's all there is? Well, Paul says in Romans 1, Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being, understand, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. In other words, we're without excuse for knowing that there is a God, that there is a creator. For those of us who know or know of God, we have to believe that there's something more beyond. He didn't just create us to live and then die and be gone forever. What, what would be the point of that? He sent Jesus into the world to reconcile us to him. Through Jesus' words, he gave us hope of something beyond, something glorious. In John 6, 54, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. So that's what we do here today by taking communion. Uh, we eat the bread, his flesh, and drink the juice, his blood, in remembrance of his sacrifice. We don't have to worry about what is beyond this life. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Let's cling to that hope. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the sacrifice of your Son to reconcile us to you. Lord, without, without that, we... We had no hope. We have nothing. Lord, we, we pray that your plan to have us with you always, we, we pray and thank you for developing that plan, Lord. Uh, we, we ask that as we partake of these elements that we remember your plan and we remember that Jesus came to save us and to give us eternal life. I ask these things in your son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Now here at Central, we uh, take communion as a corporate body. Everybody gets served, and then we take it all as, as one. Um, for those visitors, we have two cups. In the bottom cup, there is uh, the bread, and the top is the juice. So what we, it, and it's open to all believers. So if you'd like to partake, please come down the center aisle. Take a cup and return to your seat, and then we will uh, take communion as a corporate body.
Passover night when the disciples were gathered with Jesus in the upper room. After the Passover meal, he took a loaf of bread and broke it, and blessed it, and passed it among them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. And likewise, he took a cup of wine and blessed it and passed it among them, saying, Drink of this, all of you. This is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Again, we're glad you've been with us today. And if you're a guest to us this morning, we appreciate you being here with us. We know there's several options for where you could have been, and we're glad you chose to come worship God with us today. Be blessed this week, church. Let your hope be built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and His righteousness. If we rely on Him, if we let our faith deepen in Him, we can face anything that happens. Remember that. Father God, we thank You for the love You show us, for the grace You give us day after day. Help us, Father, as best we can through your power and strength to reflect that light that you've shown upon us. Help us to hold on to that anchor as we go through our lives day by day. We praise you for the security that you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week. Yes, Shirley. Well, the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God, right? And there's nothing more beautiful than looking up and just amazing at what God's done for us. Thank you, Shirley. Be blessed, church. You're dismissed. I'm sorry. Wait, wait, wait. This is our th the third Thursday coming up, so if you're part of the JAMA Food Bank team, uh, that's this Thursday from 9 till noon. And now before I say have a great week, anybody else? <laughs> Yeah, handbell choir next week if you want to be involved in that. Okay, get out of here. <laughs>